Welcome to the Jongets Games tutorial for Mosaic. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I will be showing about half of the game today. Now, I do want to ask that if you end up enjoying this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel in the creation of videos like this one in the future, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways you can really help things out, and a few of them come with bonuses like watching some of my videos early and advertisement-free, as well as voting on which of those videos are made. All right, let's now jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our two different players. Before I start, I would like to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles. I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them, and I will also add corrections below this video in a pinned comment. The next thing I'd like to mention is the fact that today I'm filming with a prototype version of the game. That means the art and components that you see here will not necessarily match those in the final version. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. In it, each player is in control of a budding civilization, and as we play through the game, we are going to be expanding out in the Mediterranean, doing a wide variety of things. One big thing involves establishing new cities as well as towns all across the map. These will unlock various new trade goods, which will help us gain money when we levy tariffs, and those cities and towns are also worth points at the end of the game. In addition to constructing out on the map, we will also bring in infantry and cavalry units into these different regions, and those are going to help us vie for a majority of influence in these specific regions. Now that is only going to matter when we get to specific scoring events, and those happen when we reveal scoring cards in these different decks, and those are revealed as we do all of the various actions in the game. When that scoring happens, there might be a little bit of combat depending on the technologies and effects each player has, and then you check for influence majorities and give points out to the players. Now, as the game goes on, players will also be developing a wide variety of technology, which will give immediate as well as ongoing benefits. Players can also increase their population as well as establish new governments, which give players new ways to score victory points as well as potentially gaining new abilities. Players can also construct massive wonders onto the map, which cost a ton of resources, but can also give a bunch of points to those players. Now, in order to get resources to do most of the things I'm talking about, players are going to have to work with their population in order to gain those resources, depending on their position on the various production tracks for those resource types. Now, as players are making decisions in the game, they must also keep in mind these civilization achievement as well as golden age cards. These are going to give victory points as well as immediate bonuses to the players who meet specific conditions first. Once we have seen three region scoring cards from these different decks, that will trigger the end of the game, and once the game is over, we will get points for a variety of things, and the player with the most points will be the winner. Now, I will describe the details of how all of these things work while we are playing, and on that note, let's now start the game. We are going to play as the blue player over here for this tutorial, and we are also the starting player, so let's now take the first turn of the game. On that note, let's focus over here on our player area. Now, there's quite a bit going on, and the first thing that I'd like to point out is this civilization board. Now, this tracks our production for a variety of different resources, as well as money, and also tracks how much population we have, as well as trade goods, and I'll talk about the details of all of these things soon. Now, this board also gives us storage areas for the various resources that come in the game. As you can see, at the moment we have 5 food and 10 stone, and we gained these resources during setup through a combination of our leader, which we chose, as well as from these starting technologies, which we did a hand draft for. Now that means during setup, each player got 5 of these starting technologies, and then kept one and passed the others to the left, and we did that 5 times, and then placed these face up in front of us, and gained all of these benefits, some of which increased production, and others can do things like place extra cities on the map, like this one over here. That technology in particular is the reason why we have two cities on the board, while our yellow opponent currently only has one. Now that I've briefly discussed what's going on in front of us, it's time for us to take our action. Now on each player's turn, they are going to take exactly one action, and there are eight different action options. For our first turn, I think let's do a build action, because we start the game with 10 stone, and this is a good way to spend that stone in order to gain benefits for our civilization. So let's focus out on the board where the eight different action options are all shown. Now in particular, the build action is up here along the top of the board, so let's take a closer look at that area. The first thing to point out is this build deck over here, and from that we dealt out five face-up build cards. 
Now, every time we perform a build action, we are going to take one of these face-up cards, or if all of these cards are gone along with the deck, we can do a basic build action that's printed over here on the board. Now, that is obviously a long ways away, and for this first turn, I think we want to select this card over here, which says we can build a research city. Next up, we have to pay for this construction, and the cost to build a city is always 4 stone and 2 population. Our population is tracked right up here, and at the moment we have 7. So that means we have to go from 7 down to 5, and then down here we have 10 stone. We can spend 4 of that right here. As you can see, that is worth 5, and I do want to point out that the resources in particular are not necessarily going to match up with those in the final version of the game. After that, we now have to place our research city token onto the map, and in order to do that, let's focus up here. As you can see, there are four different types of tokens in front of us. These over here are standard cities. These three are port cities, which can only be constructed with specific cards that say port city on them. And then these two types over here are manufacturing and farm style towns. Now, this is not a town. It is a city, which means we have to take one of these tokens here and place it out onto the map. Now, the placement rules for selecting a location for this new city are quite straightforward. It simply has to go onto a spot that does not already have a player token on it, and you cannot place a standard city onto a port location. Port locations have this fish trade good on them. As you can see, they also have this boat icon on the board, and that was there to show us where to put these fish trading tokens during the setup of the game. The final placement rule for this town has to do with the player count. You may have noticed over here we have these bowls of resources on part of the map, and that's because when you play a two-player game, you do not use the Gaul area, and you also do not use Hispania. When you play a three-player game, you do use Gaul, but you do not use Hispania. So in this two-player game, I put these bowls over here to show that we are never allowed to interact with either of those regions in any way during this two-player game. So that means we can place this onto any empty non-port spot that we see, and if there is a trade good or treasure token on that location, we immediately take that token. After considering all of these options, I think I want to construct this research city into the Numidia region. You'll note this is nowhere near our previously placed cities, and that is just fine. Now, I think we want to place it onto this location here, because that means we can immediately take this token. Now this is a treasure token, and these were all shuffled during the setup of the game and placed onto the treasure locations on the board. Next up, we can reveal the backside of this treasure and then immediately gain the benefit shown. In this case, that is going to get us seven stone back. We just spent four stone to make that city, so we've actually gained three stone total by producing that research city, so that worked out pretty well for us. So we can place this seven new stone into our storage and then discard this from the game. And it's worth noting that players can hold any amount of resources in these storage areas on their board. At the moment, it looks like we now have 13 stone. The next part of constructing a city actually has to do with this tax and tariff section of the board. In particular, this section over here, which says we have to add five money from the supply every time a city is built. And we actually have to add 10 money to the supply if this was a port style city. In this case, we did not build a port city, so we put five money over there from the supply, and this money will be taken by the next player to perform a tax and tariff action, so that incentivizes players to do that sooner rather than later. Well, it's finally time for us to deal with the research part of this research city that we just built. Up to this point, everything that we've done relates to every single city type that we build, but for this research city in particular, the card says we are going to increase our idea production by three. Currently, our idea production is at 4, so when we add 3 to that, it goes all the way up to 7. Now, I'll talk about how we actually generate ideas from this production area later on in the tutorial. The final thing we have to do is add this card to the side of our player board, and the reason for that is because it has these component icons in the bottom right corner. Now, there are 9 different types of component icons in this game, and by putting it over here, we can easily track the number of each of these components that we have within our civilization. These components show up on various build cards as well as technology cards and the leader card that we began the game with, and they are important for a variety of reasons. They are prerequisites for establishing certain governments as well as researching certain technologies. They also increase the effectiveness of various technologies that we can create, and there are many ways that we can get victory points for these components once the game is over. 
Now, the only thing that really matters about this card are these components, and the same can be said for just about everything on these starting technologies that are in front of us. So with that in mind, we don't need to keep all of these completely face up. Instead, we can stack these so that just the components and relevant text on the cards are showing. When we focus in a little more, you can see that this Royal House is going to be worth one victory point once the game is over, and this Philosophy card is going to be worth one victory point for every one of these science components that we currently have face up in our civilization. Currently, we have one, two, three total. As you can see, our leader has this government component, not a science one. This philosophy technology is one of the reasons why I wanted to make this research city, because I knew that that component right there was worth one extra victory point to us. While we're on the topic of victory points, I suppose I should point out that every city on the map at the end of the game is going to be worth two points, and every one of these towns are going to be worth one. I'd also like to point out that every city and town placed onto the map is permanent. There is no way to destroy or move these once they are placed on the map. Well, our build action is coming to a close, and the final thing that we have to do is draw the top card from this deck to fill in the spot that we removed a card from. In this case, this is a port city that just got placed out. Now, this is a city, so the cost for it is the same as the research city we just built, and this one in particular is this type, which can be placed onto the port locations on the map. Once again, these are the spots that have fish trade tokens on them and this ship icon underneath. Now that we have finished taking one action, our turn is over, and play is going to move clockwise to our opponent, and they can now take one action of their choice. Well, after considering their options, they have decided to perform a technology action for their first turn. With this in mind, they can now focus on the technology area of the board, where there is a large deck of face-down cards and five face-up cards. Now when you perform a technology action, you select one of these face-up cards, and then you must spend five of the idea resource back to the supply. Now as you can see, each of these technologies has components listed on the bottom. Many of them have immediate effects, and some of them have ongoing or even endgame scoring effects printed on them. One thing I would like to point out is the fact that some of these have prerequisites printed in the top right corner of them. For example, the food preservation technology says you must have two of the yellow food production components already face up in your civilization before you can use this technology. Now, the yellow player currently only has one of those components, but that does not mean they could not take this technology. If they wanted, they could spend their five ideas to grab this, and then they can place this face down in their area, and at any point as a free action, they can flip this over as soon as they have these prerequisites in their civilization. In this example, we can see they do have one of those food production components on all of the stuff next to their board, but not two. So if they took this, this would stay face down until they got that second component. Even though our opponent could take this card, I don't think they are going to. Instead, they've decided to develop tiles. Now, this is a simple technology. It gives them two components, and it will immediately increase their stone production by two. Now, they do, of course, have to pay for this, and as I said, they have to spend five ideas. The idea resource is over here, so they can spend all five of these, and then they can place this face up in their area and gain that benefit, which means they increase their stone production from two where it was up to the four position. Before we move on, let's consolidate our opponent's technologies so that only the components as well as text that still has impacts on the game are showing. When we focus in, it looks like they have a technology that gives them victory points for a specific type of component. In their case, that is the military component. They currently have three of those showing, and that will be worth one point for each of those. Now, they also have this bronze technology right here, and that lets them eliminate opposing enemy units in regions when scorings are about to happen. And I'll describe the details of how this combat, as well as scoring, works later on in the tutorial. The final part of this technology action involves replacing this spot on the board with a new card from the deck. Now this is the calendar technology. As you can see, it does have a prerequisite. You must have one of that component already showing to utilize this tech when you take it. And it says that when you utilize it, you immediately gain two food production for each of that specific component, including this one here, up to 10 times. Now this is a one time effect. So you want to have lots of these components when you develop that calendar to get as much food production as you can. With our opponent's turn done, we can now go again, and I think for the second turn in a row, let's build. 
With that in mind, let's focus back on the build row, and in particular, I would now like to talk about building projects as well as towns. Now to start off with these projects, each of these has a cost of five stone as well as five ideas, and then you place this card in front of you, and it gives the component listed on the bottom, and it gives you another way to score victory points once the game is over. For example, the Project Civic Center over here has one of the government component, and at the end of the game it is worth one victory point for every government component that you have in your area once the game is over. When you build these projects, you put the card in front of you, but you do not add a token to the map for those. Now the other thing that you can build are towns, and these do not have components listed in the bottom, which means after performing all of the actions on the card, you discard it, and the towns are actually free. I think that is what we want to construct on this turn, and the only town currently available to us is this manufacturing town, so let's take this card, and once again, you never spend any resources to construct a town, so we can immediately perform the effects of this card. The first effect involves building this town onto the board, and when we look at our supply, you can see that we have two different types of towns. These are manufacturing towns, and those are farming towns, and this is a manufacturing town, so we can take one of these tokens, and we must now place this onto a hex adjacent to one of our cities that does not have any other player pieces on it. This means we have a bunch of options available to us because we do have three cities already built, and I think let's go next to this city over here. And let's place it down onto this treasure. The reason for that is because this is also adjacent to our opponent's city. And remember, when you build a town, you don't spend any resources. And our opponent currently does not really have much in the way of resources. So by going over here, we are denying this treasure from our opponent. And we, of course, gain that benefit as well. Now we can flip this over. And ooh, it looks like we will immediately gain 10 food. So let's take that food, and in this prototype, the wheat tokens represent fives. So we're going to take two of these, and we can place those down next to the other five food that we started the game with. We got this five food because our magistrate leader card said we started with five food, ten stone, and one more population than we normally would have. So we finished constructing our town onto the map, and remember, when the game is over, every city is worth two points, and every town is worth one. So by building that, we just got a point. Now we also gain other benefits from this card, in particular this says we immediately gain 10 money and we will increase our tariff production by 1. Our tariff production is shown down here, we had a production of 0, so we can place this marker onto the 1 spot to show we now have a production of 1. Finally, we can take the 10 money listed on this card, and having money around is good for a couple of reasons. One big one is the fact that you can spend two money at any time as if it was a food, an idea, or a stone. So money is a flexible resource to have when you don't quite have the other resources that you need, but again, you have to spend two money for the single food, idea, or stone that you get for it. There are other ways to spend money, which I will be covering very soon. At this point, we can now discard this card from the game and then refill this empty spot on the build row with a new card. This is another type of town, the farm town in particular. Again, towns are free to build, and this one gives you five food immediately and increases your food production by one when you build it. All right, it's time for our opponent to go again, and they've decided to select the military action for their turn. The details of the military action are listed over here on the board, and one of the options you can choose is recruiting. Now this is going to cost 10 money for each military unit you recruit onto the board, and you can recruit at most two new units with each military action. Currently the yellow player has 20 money, so they have decided to recruit twice, which means they spend 10 money twice. That is going to get rid of all of their money, and now they can place two new units out onto the board. Now there are infantry units and cavalry units, and they have the same effect by themselves, but the difference between them can come into play with the technologies that players have. For example, this bronze technology that the yellow player has specifically will eliminate one enemy unit in a single region where you have an infantry unit. So that means bronze only activates on infantry, not with the cavalry. With that in mind, they've decided they are going to build two infantry and place them onto the board. It's worth noting they could have built one of each if they had instead wanted to do that. As I mentioned before, they must now place these newly recruited units into a region where they have at least one of their cities. Currently, the yellow player only has one city on the board and is over here in the Syria region, so they must place these units over here. 
Now, the exact positioning of these units does not matter within this region. They never occupy specific hexes. In fact, you don't have to put them into that region at all if you want. You could simply put them next to the region so that you know they are associated with that region over here on the map. Now, we'll just leave them over here for now so it's very obvious they are in this region. And now that yellow is done recruiting, I'd like to describe what would have happened if they had selected a move military action instead. When we focus back on the military action area, it says that when you perform movement, you spend one money per unit that is moved. The way this works is after paying one money, you can take one unit and move it into an adjacent region. At the moment, these are in Syria, and the Greek as well as the Egypt area are adjacent to this region, so that means for one money, they can move over here to Greece. But they could not move this unit into Italia, because when you do a military action, you can move each of your units at most once. So you can spend one money per unit, but you cannot spend more money on these units, so there's only so far you can go with these move actions. Now, at the moment, the yellow player does not have any money, so if they want to move these troops out of Syria, they'll have to gain some money before they do a move military action later on in the game. Yellow's military turn is done, but before we move on, I imagine you are wondering why they built these military units in the first place. Now, this has to do with the scorings that are going to happen throughout the game, and you may have noticed that there are four of these decks of cards out here on the board. Within each of these decks, there is a single scoring card, and it was shoveled into a specific part of the deck, depending on the player count. Now, as soon as we reveal that card, we will pause the game and score every single region, giving victory points to players based off of the amount of influence they have in those specific regions. The way we count influence is we add two for every city and two for every wonder that has been constructed. So far in the game, I haven't actually described how we construct these wonders, and I will get to it soon, but they offer two influence, just like the cities, and this goes to the player who constructed that wonder. Now, every military unit is going to add one influence to the majority scoring for that area, and then the player who has the most influence in that region is going to gain three points plus one point for every city and wonder in that region that are controlled by any player. So, for example, if we were to score Syria right now, the yellow player has two influence from the city and then one influence for each of these military units, bringing them to four, and we have two influence from this city and two influence from that wonder that, for the purposes of this example, I'm saying we built. So, in this example, we actually have a tie with four to four, and when there is a tie, then all of those players will gain the full benefit of having the most influence in this area. Now, as I said, that is three victory points plus one for each city and wonder in that area. So this would be three plus three or six points going to both of us because we tied. If the yellow player had just one military unit over here, they would come in second. And the second place player always gets two victory points no matter what tokens are currently in that scored region. So in this new example, we would get six points compared to the two points of yellow. Now, this game does not have victory point tokens. Instead, you write these victory points down onto a provided score pad. And when you do a scoring, you will go through every single one of these regions. Now, before you actually score these regions, every player starting with the active player will have the ability to activate any of these special scoring abilities that show up on their technologies or other effects. For example, this bronze says the yellow player could immediately, prior to each scoring round, eliminate one enemy unit in a single region where you have an infantry unit. So as you can see, this could have them eliminating one of our military units, which could swing the balance of influence in that region and give them significantly more points than they would have otherwise. Now, once again, there is a single Empire scoring card in each of these four different decks. And for example, I'll just show you what it looks like, like that. Now, when these are revealed, we will score every single one of these regions and then place this face up next to the table. And these are the way we check to see if the game is over. If at any point three of the four potential Empire scorings have happened, we will then continue playing until everyone has taken the same number of turns, and then we will all play one more turn, and then the game will be over, and we will count up our victory points. Now, I'll talk about how we count up those endgame victory points later on in the tutorial once I've covered all eight of the different actions that come in the game. Well, at the moment, yellow does have two military over here, and we have not constructed this wonder, so we can place that back off to the side, and the yellow player's turn is officially over, which means we can now go again. So, let's focus back on our area, and for our turn, I think let's increase our population. 
Our current population is five, and I would like to make that higher. And one of the main ways we do that is by performing a population action. As you can see, there is a relatively small deck of these population cards over here, and then there will be two face-up cards on the board, as long as this deck has not been depleted. Now, when we perform a population action, we are going to select one of these two cards. We will then pay the amount of food listed on the card and gain the number of population also listed on that card. Now, I think we want to gain three population, so we are going to have to pay 20 food to do this. Now, at the moment, we only have 15 of the 20 food that we need to perform this action, but we do have 10 money. And remember, two money can be spent as one food, one idea, or one stone. So we could spend 10 money as if it was five food. So we can spend 15 food along with this 10 money, and that will get us to the 20 money that we need to perform this population action. Now, that is going to increase our population three times, bringing us from five up to eight. Now, we needed population to construct that city before. Remember, we spent two population to do that. And another big reason we want population involves the work action, where we will generate resources based off of our population and our production tracks. And I imagine I'll be talking about how that works quite soon in the tutorial. So this card can now be discarded. The final thing we have to do is refill this population card spot. The new one says you can spend 12 food in order to gain two population. The other card option that was already over here only costs five food and makes one population, but of course it takes an entire turn to perform these actions. So even though the food to population ratio gets worse, you are still getting more population for your full turn action. Well, yellow can now take their turn and they have decided to do the first work action of the game. As you can see, that action is displayed over here on the board, and this is going to generate one type of resource depending on that resource's production and their current population. So they can use this work action to produce food, ideas, or stone. It is worth noting the work action does not interact with this part of the board. Now, as I said, you take your current population amount and you add that to the amount of production you have for the chosen type of resource, and then you gain that amount. This means if they wanted to produce food, they would get 5 plus 4 or 9. If they wanted to produce ideas, they would get 5 plus 5 or 10. And if they wanted stone, that would be 9 stone for them. In this case, they have decided to produce some ideas, so they are going to take 10 from the supply. So they can place these resources down over here. In this prototype, I'm using these cogwheels to represent 5 ideas each. Well, that's finished up a quick turn for our opponent. This means it's our turn, and I think I'd like to make some money. The way we do this is with the tax or tariff action. We can do this by focusing over here in the bottom left corner of the map, and the way this works is we are going to take one of these cards and then perform the effects of that card. As you can see, one says tax and one says tariff, and that is not always the case. These came from a shuffled up deck, so both could say tax or both could say tariff. Now, I think in this case, we want to take this specific tax card. It's worth noting that each tax card does not work the same way as others, and the same goes for tariff. Next up, we can perform the actions on this card. This is going to get us money equal to our current population amount, plus the number of these government components that we have in our area, and we will also gain money for our current tax production. At the moment, we have eight population. Remember, we just increased that by three, and this is part of the reason we wanted to do that before we did the tax action to get more money when we perform this. So that is going to be eight, plus we have one, two, three of the government component showing, so that brings us to 11, and then our tax production is currently at five, so that means that this is going to get us 16 money. So we can take that from the supply, and then we also gain all money on this part of the board. Remember, every time a normal city is built, five money is placed here from the supply, and every time a port city is built, ten money is placed onto this spot. We built a city earlier on, which put five money in here, and now we get to take these five money because we decided to do the tax or tariff action before our opponent did. That means with this action, we actually made 21 money total. So we can place this money into our storage area, and then this tax card will be placed next to our board, where it will stay for the rest of the game. Now, the only part that matters now is at the bottom. This right here says to unrest. Now, in general, people don't like it when you tax them, and that is shown in this game with the amount of unrest that that gives us. And when the game is over, we are going to lose victory points equal to our unrest. Fortunately, there are ways to lower the amount of unrest that we have, but for the moment, we don't have any of those, so that means this is worth negative two points to us. 
Before we move on, I'd like to focus on our opponent's leader. As you can see, as a benefit of being the artist, they get minus four unrest. That means the first four unrest that they get will not be worth negative points to them. The final thing we have to do is reveal a new card from this stack. That is a tariff card, so that means the next time somebody does a tax and tariff action, they can only choose from the tariff option. Now, in general, the taxes and tariffs have similar effects between them, but the specifics of those cards do differ. For example, this tariff gives two money for each unique trade good and one money for each city, whereas that one gives three money for each unique trade good and two money for the cities, but this does have two unrest compared to the one from this one. Now, I will describe the details of what these unique trade goods are later on in the tutorial. Well, it's now the yellow player's turn, and they have decided to perform a government action. This will let them establish a government for their civilization. At the beginning of the game, each civilization does not have a government. In order to do this government action, they have to look at this part of the main board. As you can see, there are six different governments that come in the game, and each of them has a component requirement as well as an idea cost to establish them. Now, at the moment, the yellow player has 10 ideas, and that means they could afford the theocracy or the tyranny. You can see all of the other ones require 15 or even 20 ideas to establish. So these are the two options they could afford with their ideas. But ideas alone are not what you need to establish a government. There are also component requirements. For the theocracy, they have to have at least one of the black government components. And for the tyranny, they have to have at least one of the red military components. Now, you don't spend these. These are just thresholds. And when we look out at their components, they have three of the military components and currently none of the government ones. That means even though they have the ideas to start a theocracy, they don't have the components, so this is not an option for them. And the government they are going to go with is tyranny, because this is the only one they can go for. Now that is going to cost them just five of their ideas. They obviously have the component that they need for this, so now they can flip this over and place it onto their board. Next up, let's focus on the backside of this, where it says as a tyranny type government, they are going to gain one extra victory point for each region on the board that they control during the empire scorings. Currently, they control this region right here with four influence to our two, but we do control two other regions. But fortunately for the yellow player, those empire scorings don't happen until we get a decent way through any of these decks, so they still have a while to set themselves up to get as many points as they can for that tyranny government. Before we move on, I'd like to focus back over here on the government area, and as you can see, Tyranny is the only government type that does not require at least one of the government component, which does make sense to a certain degree. Now, let's flip all of these over to see the benefits of each of them. The city-state's government says that during the empire scoring, you can select one region and gain one victory point for every city of yours in that region. Next up there is Monarchy, and it says as long as you are a monarchy, you gain 5 production of food and stone, and during the Empire scoring, you get 2 victory points per wonder that you have. After that, the Oligarchy says as long as you have this government, you gain plus 5 tax and tariff production, and during the Empire scoring, you get 1 victory point for each Golden Age and Civilization achievement that you have, and I'll describe the details of how those work later on in the tutorial. After that, there is the Republic, with a very strong effect that lets you look at the top card of any deck before you take the associated action. You can then use that card instead of one of them from the card row, and obviously you won't refill the card row because you won't take any. So that increases the number of options that you have for the technology, population, build, and tax and tariff actions by one. This also says during Empire Scoring, you get one victory point for every two population you have. Finally, the Theocracy says during Empire Scoring, you get one victory point for each region that contains one of your cities, so you don't necessarily have to control that region to get the victory point for it. This definitely incentivizes you to spread out with your cities across the map. Now, I do want to point out that each civilization can have at most one government, but you are allowed to change it as the game goes on. You simply have to have the requirements and pay the associated idea cost, and if you already had a government, you simply return that back to the supply and take the government that you want to establish with that new action. All right, yellow is done, which means we get to go, and I would like to construct a wonder in our future, but we don't quite have enough resources for it. So for this turn, let's do a work action, and let's produce stone. Now, this means we are only going to get two stone from our stone production, but we also get eight from our population. So all told, we are going to gain 10 stone. 
So we can add that into our storage, and that finished up a quick turn for us. Next up, yellow can go, and they also want to produce. This time they want to make stone, so they are going to make 4 plus 5, or 9 stone total. And that's finished a quick turn for them. Alright, it's our turn again, and I think it's time for us to construct a wonder. This is the eighth type of action that I've discussed, and it is going to cost stone as well as food, but I figure we'll spend money instead of food when we do this. So let's focus on the wonder action part of the board, and it says the first wonder that we construct in the game will cost 20 stone and 5 food. When we go to build a second wonder, that will cost 25 stone and 10 food, and each subsequent wonder will cost 5 stone and 5 food more than the previous one did. So we can spend 20 stone since this is our first wonder, and for the 5 food, we are going to spend 10 of our money. Again, 2 money counts for 1 food. It is true we could have spent this turn producing food and then building a wonder on our next turn, but of course that would be an entire turn we would lose in the process and we did have the money to spend. Now that we've paid for it, we can select one of these wonders and construct it out into a region that has at least one of our cities in it. As you can see, there are a bunch of options out here and every single one of these is worth a number of endgame victory points, which varies depending on a variety of conditions. Now, I think we want to construct the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. And a big reason for that is because it gives us negative 5 unrest. Now once again, at the end of the game, we lose 1 point for every unrest we have, but we are going to sum these together and then see if we lose points. So if the game ended right now, we would have minus 5 plus 2 or minus 3 unrest, which would be worth 0 negative points. So by having the Hanging Gardens over here, we can actually take 3 more unrest before that starts to cost us victory points, and I imagine we are likely going to do more taxation or potentially tariff actions later in the future, which will give us some unrest. Now we can place the Hanging Gardens over here, and it says at the end of the game, this is going to be worth 3 victory points for every adjacent city to it. With that in mind, we can now place this onto the map. It has to go onto a hex that currently does not have any player or wonder tokens, and it also has to go into a region that has at least one of our cities. That means we could build into Syria, Egypt, or Numidia. Now this is worth 3 points per adjacent city, so we could place it right over there, because it would already be adjacent to two cities. One of them is our opponents, but that would not change the way this scores for us. So by placing there, it would already be worth 6 points to us. We could also look to the future and place this somewhere like that and then hope to surround this with our cities to get more points. And obviously there are a bunch of these bonus tokens on the board we could take when we constructed the cities around that if that was a plan we wanted to go for. Now one other thing to consider is that this does give us two influence for the region scoring. So I do think we are going to place it right over here. And in that way we have now tied the yellow player for influence in Syria. Now, after we have placed that, we gained this trade token that was randomly placed there at the start of the game, and all trade tokens are placed into the trade good area of our board. If we already had a good of this type, we would simply stack it on top of a previous one, but as you can see, this is the first of that type that we have, and there are eight different trade good types that are out here on the board. Now it's worth noting, we never actually remove these trade goods from our board, but there are several ways we can gain benefits for having different types of these trade goods on our board. As you can see, we have two of these. We picked this one up during setup when we placed our cities out onto the board before the game started. One of the benefits for having trade goods is doing tariff actions. For example, this one over here, when taken, would get us three money for each unique trade good that we had, and currently we have two, so if we did the tariff action right now, we would get three plus three or six money for that, and then we would obviously get two money for every city we have on the board, and we'd get money for our tariff production. So having more unique trade goods on our board makes our tariff actions stronger, which gets us more money, which is good considering these do come along with unrest. In addition to that, there are other reasons to have lots of trade goods. This uh, wonder over here is worth one victory point for every unique trade good that you have at the end of the game as one example. And another reason to have lots of trade goods involves one of these civilization achievements, in particular this merchant civilization here. Now, I haven't described these just yet, and I think now is a good time. And when you're playing the game, as soon as you meet the requirement listed on a specific civilization achievement, you can then take that, and it will be worth 6 victory points to you at the end of the game, and obviously your opponents will not have access to it because you got there first. 
So this civilization requirement here says you get these six victory points once you have seven unique trade goods. And remember, there are eight different trade goods out there on the board. So chasing after these six points is one reason also to go for a wide variety of those unique goods. Now, while we're over here, let's take a look at the rest of these civilization achievements. This one will give six points if you have five projects or wonders total already constructed. The urban civilization will go to the player who has five cities out on the board. We currently have three, so we just need two more cities to pick up those points. The seafaring civilization is going to give six points to the player who has three port cities. Currently, no one has any of those, but that is another reason to place lots of ports on the board. The populous civilization will go to the player who has 12 population, and currently we have 8, so this is another one we are not too far off from, although we would need a decent amount of food to increase our population 4 times to grab those 6 points. The well-governed civilization will go to the player who has a tax production of 12, and the scholarly civilization will go to a player who has an idea production of 12 or more. Now, the militaristic civilization goes to the first player to have six military units on the board, and the final one of these goes to the player who controls four regions at any one point in time. So, these achievements give you reasons to push hard on specific parts of the game, and there are a wide variety of ways you can gain these achievements to get those points. Now, while we're over here, I'd also like to discuss these Golden Age cards that are also up on top of the board. Now, these, just like the achievements, will immediately go to players as soon as they meet its associated requirement. But for the Golden Age cards, those are all associated with components. There are nine different components that come in the game, and there is one Golden Age associated with each of them, and you have to have six of that specific component in order to take that Golden Age card. Just like the Civilization Achievements, every Golden Age card is worth 6 points at the end of the game, but in addition to those points, they also immediately come with a bonus you get as soon as you take that card. For example, Architecture lets you increase your stone production by 1, and City States lets you immediately place a free city out onto the board. So there are a bunch of good actions you get for free when you hit these thresholds, and these give you an extra incentive to have 6 or more of specific component types before your opponents do. Well, at this point, we've finished up our Wonder Construction turn, although before we move on, I want to say one more thing about trade goods. You may have noticed that some of these show an X2 symbol next to them, and that's because those specific trade goods are associated with the uh, production of food or stone. Now, whenever you take a trade good that is a fish or a wheat on it, you place it onto this spot, either stacked on top of others or onto new locations like this if it's unique, and you immediately increase your food production by two. So that means if we were to take another wheat, even though this is not a new unique trade good, it would still boost our food production twice, which would definitely be a good thing for us. Likewise, you will have one specific spot for the stone trade good, and when you take that, it will also increase your stone production twice every single time you take a new stone trade good and place it onto your board. So, our wonder is now constructed, but before we finish our turn, it looks like our opponent is going to gain a benefit. Since they have the artist leader, that has an ongoing benefit that says they get 10 money whenever anyone builds a wonder. So with that in mind, maybe it wasn't the best idea for us to do this at this point in the game, but we're still going to stick with it. So, even though it was our turn, our opponent gets 10 money because of that specific leader bonus. Now, talking about leader bonuses, we also have one of those, and ours is a one-time use per game. This says we can convert one of our population into 10 of any other currency, and you can only do this once, but it is a free action whenever we want to. So obviously we lose one population, but we immediately get 10 currency, which could be very important for pulling off a specific plan that we might have in motion. Alright, our turn is done, and since I've covered all 8 of the actions that come in this game, I think it's now time to discuss how we calculate our endgame victory points once the game is over. Remember, the game end will be triggered once our third Empire scoring happens. We will then keep playing until everyone has had the same number of turns, and then we all take one more turn, so that we always take the same number of turns between each player. At that point, we then will add victory points for a wide variety of things to any points that we have gained throughout the game through the Empire scorings, and remember, all of this is logged on a provided scoring pad. The first area we get endgame points for are our cities and towns constructed on the map. Every city is worth 2 points, and every town is worth 1. Next up, we will all score for the constructed wonders we have in front of us. Some of them are a set number of victory points, whereas others are based on a condition. For example, our Hanging Gardens is worth 3 points for each adjacent city, so if the game ended right now, it would be worth 6 points to us. 
After that, we will all score the victory points showing up on the Civilization achievements and Golden Age cards that we have taken throughout the game. Next up, every player who has constructed projects in front of them will get points based off of the number of components they have. For example, this Civic Center project will be worth one point at the end of the game for every government component that you have face up in your civilization. After that, we can score points that show up in the technologies that we have developed throughout the game. That might be a set amount of points, like this Royal House is just going to give one victory point for having it, but then others could give a conditional amount of points. This one is worth one victory point for each of that component that you have in your civilization once the game is over. After that, you can check your leaders to see if they have specific end game scoring conditions on them, although neither of these do. And finally, we potentially lose points for our unrest. Now, as I said, you take your positive unrest that will come from a couple of sources, and then you will add to that any negative unrest you have from leaders or other locations like this uh, wonder right here. And then if the number you get after that is positive, you lose that amount of points. Once again, for this example, we have negative five on the hanging gardens and positive two unrest for this taxation action. That would leave us at negative three. And since that is not a positive number, we would not lose any points in this instance. Once everyone has calculated their scores, the player with the most victory points will be the winner, and if there is a tie, then the player who has constructed the most wonders will break it in their favor. If there is still a tie, then the player with the most money at the end of the game will break it in their favor, and if somehow there is still a tie after that, the players will share in the victory. Well, at this point I've covered just about all of the rules to the game, which means the tutorial part of this video has come to a close. I do think I'm going to keep playing the game, however, and let's keep going until we hit one of the game's scoring conditions so that we can see how that is going to work with an overall example. Now, at this point, it is the yellow player's turn, and they've decided to build. In particular, they want to construct a port city. And if you remember from before, the cost to build any city is two population, as well as four stone. Next up, they can add this out onto the board, and since this is a port city, they're going to place this figure out instead of the other city token that we've seen so far. Since this is a port city, it must be placed onto a port, and again, those are the locations that have this fish trade good token on them. Now, the yellow player has decided they would like to build this port right over here, and then they, of course, take this fish trade good and then add that onto their board. Since this is their first fish trade good, they put it into its own pile. And remember, the fish and wheat trade goods will increase the food production by two when you take them. So their food production will go from four up to six. Next up, we can see that this port city is going to get them 10 money. So they can take that right now. And then finally, they can place this off to the side of their civilization board. Before yellow finishes their turn, they do have to add 10 money from the supply onto this area because they built a port city. They can finish their turn by drawing another build card. This is another manufacturing town. Yellow's turn is done, which means we can go. And I think let's do a build action of our own. Currently, we don't have any food. And I think because of that, let's build another town. Remember, towns do not cost any resources. And this is going to get us five food as well as increase our food production once. So we can place this five food token there and increase our production to five. And now we can place one of these farm towns down onto the board adjacent to a previous city of ours. Now, part of me wants to place this farm down onto a spot that has a food or a stone trade good to increase those specific tracks. But we do also have an opportunity to take a treasure and these immediately give resources. So I think let's go for that. We can place this farm right over there, and remember, every one of these towns is worth one point at the end of the game, but does not offer any influence when we do the Empire scoring. Now, this treasure is going to get us eight ideas. Nice. We can place those onto our board, and then we can refill this to finish our turn. All right, the yellow player can go, and they've decided to spend five of their ideas to develop a new technology. The one they've decided to choose is Drama. As you can see, that is going to get them one of this culture component, and it will immediately get them five more ideas that they could use to develop again, and it also gets them three points at the end of the game. So they can place this over here and get those five ideas back. After that, they can finish their turn by drawing a new card. This harbor has these component requirements, and when you build it, you get three components, as well as two added to your tariff production and two more food production. Well, it's now our turn, and let's research a new technology. That is going to cost five of our ideas. And the one I think we should research is the calendar. 
that does have a requirement of us having one of this component already. And as you can see, we actually have three of that component, so we are fine. Now this gives us another one, which is good, considering this is going to get us one point for each of that component type at the end of the game. And now immediately, this is going to increase our food production twice for every one of that component that we have, up to a maximum of 10 more food production. Currently, we have one, two, three, four of that icon, so that means our food production will go up by eight. Our food production was at five, so we are going to go up to 13. And we can show that by putting this on the three, and then we can put this token on the 10 to show that we have 10 plus three or 13 food production. Well, that was a great technology for us, especially considering it also had four components, which help for other things. We have four of those government components now, which is more than enough for us to develop any of the government types, at least as far as that specific component is concerned. Gaining a government does take a bunch of ideas, though, and we currently only have three, so that's something we'll keep in mind, but maybe we'll need to produce some new ideas before we get there. Well, we can finish our turn by drawing a new technology. This is Diplomats. That says you can immediately, prior to each scoring round, move all military units owned by a single opponent out of a single region to an adjacent region of your choice. So this is another way to manipulate things before the scorings. It does not remove units, but it does move them around, and you can push them into a location that will get you more victory points as the player with the Diplomats. Our turn is done, which means that the yellow player can go, and they're actually going to develop more technology on their own. They have five ideas, so they are going to spend that right now. And then they are going to research fermenting. This does have a requirement of them having one of this coin type component. And at the moment, it appears they have four of them, so they have more than enough. Now this gives them two more components, and at the end of the game, makes every one of this purple component worth one victory point. And as you can see, they have one, two, three, four of those in their civilization already. Yellow can finish their turn by drawing a new technology. This is plumbing, and that simply gets you to population, although you do have to have these prerequisites first. All right, it's our turn, and we actually do have the prerequisites that plumbing needs. We have one of that, and we have more than one of that one there. And I think let's research some more technology. It's something that both of us are doing quite a bit right now. This is going to take five ideas, and we currently only have three, but we can spend four of our money to make up for the other two ideas that we need to make this happen. So we can take one back from the supply and then take plumbing and immediately put it face up in front of us because we have this prerequisite taken care of. Now that is going to increase our population twice, which brings us up to 10. And we are now just two population away from taking this populous civilization achievement. That is something that hopefully we can make happen soon. All right, we are done so we can reveal a new technology. This is architecture and it increases population once and it increases stone production once. At this point, the yellow player can now go, and they have decided to perform a tariff action. As you can see, both of the options over here are tariffs, and this is the one they want. That is going to get them to unrest, and now they will gain money equal to three times the number of unique trade goods they have, plus two money for every city they have, and also they will get money for their tariff production, in addition to this ten money that was placed over here when the yellow player built that port city. So they can add the ten money over here, they also have three different trade goods, so that is nine more money. And in addition to that, they have a tariff production of five. So they are at 14 more, and now they can get two more for each city they've built out on the map. It appears yellow has two cities, so that is four more, which means they can take 18 money from the supply. So this was a very lucrative turn for them. They did gain two unrest, but they also got 28 money total, and that means they now have 48 money in front of them. Next up, they can finish their turn by drawing a new card. This is a three unrest tax card that gives money equal to twice your population, plus two money for every one of those government components, and of course, money for your tax production. Well, it's time for us to go, and I think let's produce a bunch of food. We currently have a food production of 13 here, plus we also have 10 population, so that means we will get 23 food by taking this work action. We already had five, so we now have 28 food in front of us. Our turn is done, so yellow can go, and they want to perform another military action. Now, they've decided for their action to recruit two new units, and each of those costs 10 money. They have 48 money, so they're definitely going to spend 20 of that to place two more onto the map. Currently, they have technology which aids them with infantry, so they're going to put two more infantry down. 
These must go into regions with at least one of their city, and they could split them up if they want, but they've decided to actually place both of these over here, where they now have a clear majority with six of their influence compared to four of ours. Since they recruited, that means they are not allowed to move, and that's going to finish their turn. Well, their turn is done, which means we can go and let's use our massive supply of food to increase our population. When we do this action, the most we can spend is going to be 12 food to increase our population twice, so let's go for that. So we can spend 12 of our food, and it looks like we still have 16 left, and that increases our population from 10 up to 12. The moment that happens, we now qualify for taking the Populous Civilization Achievement. Now this is a free action, we simply grab it from this area, and that is going to be worth 6 points to us at the end of the game, and we can go below 12 population in the future, we just have to have it at any one point when we take this Civilization Achievement. So we can place this over there, and then we can finish our turn by drawing another population card, and that is a big one! You have to pay 30 food, but you do increase your population four times for a single population action. All right, yellow can go, and they are going to produce some ideas. Unfortunately, they're not going to make a ton, but they really would like at least five. And fortunately, they're going to make five plus three or eight. So that is going to be enough for them to develop more technology. And it does seem like that's what they want to do soon. So here are their eight ideas, and that's finished their turn. Well, we can go again, and I like the idea of taking that plus four population card while we can, although that does need 30 food, and we currently have 16. So let's go ahead and do another food production turn. We are going to get 13 plus 12, or 25 food for this turn. That's going to put us up to 41 food, which seems like a lot, but we are planning on spending 30 of that on our next turn. Now, having a bunch of population is good, obviously, for making other resources, and I am planning on using that population to build a bunch of cities later on in the game, so I figure pushing hard on it now and then getting resources out of it as we then spend it is probably a good way for us to go. Either way, that has finished our turn, and now the yellow player can go, and they have decided to build a city. That is going to cost two of their population, so they've gone down to just one, and then they also have to spend four of their stone, which leaves them with one remaining. Next up, they can build a city, and there are two options for them on the build row. The architectural city would get them five stone back, and the garrison city would let them build one military unit down after they construct it, and this is the one they've decided to go with. It appears yellow is leaning quite hard into military. So they can place this garrison city down, and they've decided to go right here so that they can take this treasure. Now that is going to get them six food, which is certainly a nice reward for them. And then they will also gain one military unit, as well as both of these components. Now they've decided to put an infantry out. They are going heavy on infantry right now just because they have this bronze technology which interacts with one region with these and they don't currently know what region they would potentially do that in because so far we actually haven't built any military units and the fact that our opponent has bronze is part of the reason why we've shied away from that. So yellow can place this out and it'll go over here and they have now taken control of this region since they have three influence to our two. Since a standard city was built, five money will be placed over here from the supply and now they can reveal a new build card to finish their turn. That means we are up, and let's continue with our population explosion. We are going to pay 30 food in order to increase our population four times. Currently we have 41 food, so we can certainly afford this. And now our population will go from 12 all the way up to 16. After that we can reveal a new population card, and this one costs 12 food to increase population twice. Our turn is done, so yellow can go, and they would like to spend five of their ideas in order to develop a new technology. In particular, they want to develop food preservation. Now that has a requirement where they have to have two of these food components already, and it looks like they do have that with the second one coming somewhat recently for them. Now this says they are going to immediately gain two military units, either infantry or cavalry. They will also get five food, and they will increase their population once. So they'll put five food over here, their population will go back up to two, and now they've decided they are going to actually put a couple cavalry out. They don't have any technology that works for these just yet, but it's possible that one might come out, and they like the idea of being ready to use it with cavalry already on the map. They can place these into regions where they have a city, and they'll put one into Greece and another one into Syria. Now at this moment, yellow has seven military units on the board. 
which means they have enough to take the militaristic civilization achievement, which needs them to only have six military units out at once. So they'll grab this, and that is worth six points to them at the end of the game. After that, they can finish their turn by drawing a new technology. This is the scientific method. It has that prerequisite, and when you develop this, you immediately get three more idea production, and you clear the technology offer off. You put those cards to the bottom of the deck, and then you deal new cards out. So the scientific method will provide a bunch of new technology options for the players, as well as push the game closer to the Empire scoring card that's somewhere in that draw deck. Yellow is done, so we can go, and let's perform a tax action. As you can see, there is one of these over here, so this is the card we're going to take. That will increase our unrest by three. It will also get us this five money over there from the previous city being built since the last tax or tariff action. This will also get us two money for our population, as well as two money for each government component, and money for our tax production amount. Well, we can place this here, and our population is at 16, so this will get us 2 times 16, or 32 money. We also have 1, 2, 3, 4 of those government components, so that is going to be 4 times 2, or 8 more money there, and our tax production is at 5. All told, that is 45 more money that we can add into our supply, and then we now have 3 plus 2 unrest. That's going to get us to 5, but remember our Hanging Gardens has minus 5 unrest, so that means we are currently at 0 for the unrest penalty if the game was to end at this point. Well, our turn is over, so we can reveal the next card, and there are 2 tariffs out. So, Yellow can take their next turn, and they have decided to do a military action, and they are going to move troops around instead of adding new ones onto the map. Remember, when you do this option, you can move each of your troops just once, and each of those moves costs one money. Now, they are going to do one move to start by bringing this cavalry over into Italia, where they do now control it with one influence compared to our zero. That will cost them one money. And then they're going to move two of their infantry from Syria down into Egypt. Each of those will cost one money, so they have to spend two more back to the supply. And at this point, they are going to stop with their movement. Now we can see they currently control Numidia. They also control Italy as well as Greece because they are unopposed. Over here, they have five influence to our four, so they control Syria. And they are tied for control over here in Egypt, so yellow is dominating the board. Now, at this moment, they do control at least four regions, which means they can claim the Imperial Civilization achievement, which will be worth six points to them at the end of the game. All right, yellow is done, which means we can go. And at this point in the game, it would not surprise me if we were getting close to some of those Empire scoring cards in those decks. Now, for our turn, I think we should do the first military action of ours in the game, and we have a bunch of money to afford this. Let's go ahead and recruit twice. Remember, each of these costs 10 money, and you can recruit at most two times per action. With this paid, let's now put two troops on the board, and I figure we'll do one infantry as well as one cavalry. These will then go into regions where we have at least one city, and I think let's put them both over here into Syria. Now we know our opponent has that bronze technology, which can eliminate one of our troops where they have at least one infantry, but if they did that over here, we would still tie, and remember, ties in the scorings are going to be favorable, and this is the most lucrative region on the map as far as victory points are concerned. So we are setting ourselves up to potentially lose one and still do well over here. We're not sure exactly when the next empire scoring is going to be, but again, it could be around the corner or many turns off. Either way, we are now done with our military action, which means our opponent can go, and they are going to do a population action. Their population amount is currently quite low. Now, they would like to do this one here, which is going to cost 12 food to increase their population twice. We can see they currently have 11 food, so they are going to spend two of their money to make up for the last one they need. So they'll get three money back in change, and then their population will go up twice, bringing them to four. They can finish their turn by drawing a new population card. Oh, and it looks like we have reached the first one of the Empire scorings. Now, when this is revealed, we always finish the current player's turn before doing the scoring, and we also do need to draw another card to make sure we have a valid card on the offer over here. Now, remember, each of these stacks of cards has just one Empire scoring in it. This stack in particular had its Empire scoring shuffled in on the bottom half. It appears this was near the top of that bottom half of cards. So, it's now time for us to perform the first Empire scoring of the game, since the yellow player's turn is done. At this point, all players can use any actions that activate during a scoring, and this happens in turn order, with each player performing as many actions as they can. 
At this point in the game, there is only one of those, though, and that is our opponent. This bronze technology says they can immediately, prior to each scoring round, eliminate one enemy unit in a single region where they have at least one infantry unit. Currently, the only legal spot for them to do that is over here in Syria. They do have at least one infantry, so they are going to use that to eliminate one of our units, and they'll get rid of this infantry here, which will go back into our supply. At this point, no one else has any abilities to activate. There are a couple of them on the technology offer, but neither of us actually went for those before this scoring happened. So we can now score each one of the regions on the board, and we'll start down here with Egypt. The first thing we do is count up influence. We have two influence for this city, and the yellow player has one influence each for these troops. So that is two versus two, which means we have a tie for the lead. When there's a tie, then everyone gets points equal to the first place position reward. Remember, that reward is going to be three points plus one point for every city, as well as one within that region that is controlled by any player. So in this case, that will be three points plus one or four points. So that means we will get four points and our opponent will also get four points in this region. Moving on to Syria, yellow has one, two, three, four, five influence compared to our two, four, five. So we once again have a tie and the first place reward over here is going to be three plus one, two, three. So that is six points. So that means we get six points and yellow gets six points. Remember, yellow would have gotten all of that six points to themselves if we had not built those military units on our previous action. Next up, we can score Greece, where yellow has two influence compared to our zero. That means yellow is going to get three plus one for this city, or four points, and we do not get any points for being in second place because you have to have at least one influence to score second place points. Now, the same thing can be said over here in Italy, where it is one influence to zero. That means yellow is going to get three points because there are no other cities or wonders in this area. Finally, in Numidia, yellow has three influence compared to our two. So that means yellow is going to get three points plus two. So that is going to be five points total for them. And we are in second place. And the second place player always gets a flat two points. Before we finish this empire scoring, the yellow player does have one other way to get points, and that is through their tyranny government tile. This says during the empire scoring, they will get one extra victory point for every region that they control. When they focus back out on the map, they currently only control three of these regions because regions where you tie for the most influence do not count for control. That means they are going to get three extra points total from their tyranny government, and then overall, they got 25 points in this scoring compared to the 12 points that we got, so our opponent did way better than we did in this first empire scoring in the game. The scoring is now over, so we can place this off to the side of the board, and remember, the game end will be triggered once three of those scorings have happened. We will then play until everyone has had the same number of turns. We will then all take one more turn and then proceed with endgame scoring to finally see who will be the winner of the game. Well, it would now be time for us to take our next turn, but I think this is a good point to stop playing through the game since we have now seen one of the scorings. I hope that you've enjoyed learning how to play Mosaic. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.